All right, hello everyone, and welcome to the 2021 Slave Drilling Project. I am happy to introduce Leslie, Karen, and Angela. They are three women with Georgia roots connecting the dots between past and present. They have been researching racial, racial justice. All three ladies are members of Coming to the Table, and both Angela and Leslie are on the board of the Slave Drilling Project. So we are happy to have them here and excited to hear them speak. Um, so go ahead and take it away, ladies. Hi, uh, I'm Leslie Staten. I'm a board member of the Slave Dwelling Project, and um, we are having some technical difficulties with our fellow presenter, Karen Brannon. So uh, I will be reading her, um, her talk. And let's go to PowerPoint. Can everybody see that? Okay. Karen's talk is uh, connecting the dots from Hamilton, Georgia to Washington, DC. On January 6th, and this has been Karen's voice, I was sitting in my house 10 blocks from the US Capitol when the scream of sirens split the air and I turned on the TV to see armed men and women with Confederate flags battling police and erecting a scaffold with a noose. Holy shit, I muttered, it's 1912 all over again. Back in the early 1990s, I had a biracial grandchild on the way, and despite many years working for racial justice, I was terrified to tell my racist family in Georgia. I kept this child a secret until nightmares and a ghost woman on my bed said, go home, find out what happened. From childhood, I had known something was wrong. There were too many secrets, too much anxiety about black people. It was time to connect some dots. For many years, I drove back and forth to Georgia, interviewing elders and experts, researching documents, combing through cemeteries. This briefly is what I found. Slaughtered lives, stolen land, forced enslaved labor, rejected and murdered biracial children, criminal kinfolk unpunished by law, but twisted in spirit. My third great grandfather, Brigadier General Elias Beale, drove Seminole people out of Florida in 1812. His son and nephew drove Cherokee people out of Georgia, killing thousands on what became known as the Trail of Tears, all to enable white settlers to steal natives' land. General Elias Beale was then commissioned by the governor to lay out Columbus, Georgia, and dole out those stolen Indian lands. He settled 20 miles north in Harris County here to become a large slaveholder and founder of numerous Baptist churches wherein was preached the righteousness of slavery and the subhumanity of the enslaved. There, my father's extended family enslaved hundreds who were forced to work thousands of acres gained by theft. Two great grandfathers served as sheriff and auctioned off enslaved children separated from their parents while giving other enslaved people 40 lashes for which the slavers paid $1. Young boys cut their teeth on their right to monitor and punish black behavior and any white man who chose to become slave patrollers. In this and many other ways, a newly forming legal system was being braided with a brutal slave system which would maintain in part this ideology, attitude, and behavior to the present day. With the loss of the war and their primary source of income and identity, my ancestors diabolically set about to build a new and in some ways more brutal form of slavery. They weaponized the 13th Amendment and continued what they knew best, the Negro control business. As sheriffs, seven total, they turned their heads when kinfolk and neighbors murdered black people in cold blood and dumped their bodies in the river. As judges, they ruled in favor of white men more often than not, regardless of the facts. As senators and state representatives, they served on prisons and parole committees that created the draconian convict labor system that re-enslaved millions, killed thousands, and enriched countless white people. My mother's side, while less wealthy, enslaving fewer people, followed the same pattern. In 1912, my maternal great-grandfather, Doug had, uh, was sheriff of Harris County. His son, the man you see here, Sheriff Doug Hanley, my grandfather was his deputy and a new Confederate statue had just been erected in the town square. 
When his nephew was murdered and three African-American men were suspected, he rounded them up along with a black woman he trusted to be his star witness against the men. One of the men was a minister who bravely preached against the predatory ways of the sheriff's nephew. Another was the father of a 14-year-old girl pursued by the 34-year-old nephew and a deacon in the preacher's church. The third man was the fiancé of the girl. He was also cousin to the sheriff and the deputy, therefore my cousin. The issue was interracial sex and family, a long-standing practice in Harris and many other southern counties, ranging from rape to long-term relationships about which little is known. Black and white preachers and politicians alike were trying to stamp it out, but the widespread and wholesale rape of black girls and women by white men was not being punished and had long been the true crime behind white people's cries of black rapist as an excuse for lynching thousands of black people. Had this case come to court, the great hypocrisy of the South would have hit headlines across the country. Better those headlines should be the vicious lynching of four innocent people, including the first woman to be lynched in Georgia because she refused to accuse three innocent men, all her friends, one, her preacher. Beside the baptismal font at Friendship Baptist Church, as I immersed myself in this horror of family and American history, I could not help but think, thank God that is all past. What a foolish little white girl I was, for I knew better not enough, but not enough better. Until May 25th, 2020, when I would be forced to connect another dot, when four blocks from where I had lived for 13 years in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I turned on the TV to see the familiar cup food store and to see a lynching happening in real time. As a former investigative reporter covering some stories there for Life magazine, I knew of brutality among Minneapolis cops. This, though, was a cut above. There, in broad daylight, with a crowd pleading for mercy, a white police officer deliberately choked the life out of George Floyd. Fast forward six months to January 6, 2021. Here on live TV, just down my street, Hundreds, perhaps thousands of men and women attacked the Capitol, busting through windows and doors. Your book is coming to life, a friend texted. I looked for the face of my long dead grandfather's uncles, cousins in the crowd. 15 miles up the road on this dark day, my African-American cousin, Jackie Irvine, sat traumatized as she watched this scene. Jackie and I are both cousins to John Moore, that 21-year-old man, the youngest of the four lynched in Hamilton, Georgia, at midnight beside the baptismal font at Friendship Baptist Church. Her great-great-grandmother fled to East St. Louis following his murder. The lynching was never mentioned in her family. The connection of this capital invasion to that midnight massacre in Hamilton, Georgia was not lost on my friend, Dr. Irvine, former chair of Emory University's Department of Urban Education. She wrote this, published in Medium, quote, like the Georgia lynch mob, this 2021 mob of Trump insurgents included so-called upstanding citizens, police, military, who believed their country was threatened by the other, in quotation marks. The 1912 and the 2021 murder scenes took place on hallowed grounds, one at the Black Church and the other at the United States Capitol. Like the 1912 mob, lynch mob, the 2021 rioters wore their insignia and carried the Confederate flag, ropes, guns, and knives. They even hung a noose from a scaffold they constructed. During both time periods, the mobs arrogantly flaunted their white privilege, unafraid of consequences or punishments. Both mobs took pictures and stole souvenirs. And this is my friend, Dr. Irvine, continuing to speak. The similarities of the two events sent me into despair and rage. 70 million people voted for Donald Trump and hypocritical politicians who promoted discord for years and enabled terrorists now call for unity and healing. I am not persuaded. 
There cannot be healing without justice. From slavery to Jim Crow to the present day, African Americans continue to suffer because of racist acts and institutional racism that have never been adequately addressed. The lynch mobs of the past, like the one in Harris County, were never held accountable. Many of the white supremacists who attacked the Capitol will never be punished. No superficial plan to unite America along racial, class, geographic, or cultural lines will solve America's colossal divide. If solutions fail to punish the guilty and address persistent structural inequalities and racial disparities, there will never be systemic change. I suspect without these efforts, I may see a sequel to this lynching nightmare. Thus ends my friend, Dr. Irvine. Long-term effects of racial violence across America are still being cataloged. Voter registration is lower in states and counties where they occurred, not to mention overall quality of life indicators for African Americans. Some white people today are like me, beginning to examine the toll taken on us as well by the pathological beliefs and behaviors of our forebears, which too many of us still carry out. What are we doing to transform this dire legacy? Like we on this panel, white people must first face it. Once deeply and authentically faced, the imperative to act on several levels becomes clear. Today, my sister panelists, Jackie Irvine and I, with other linked descendants, work together for justice. We'll discuss some of those ways in the Q&A. And this is a picture of Karen Brannan at the Equal Justice Initiative with Brian Stevenson and descendants of the victims of that lynching in Georgia in 1912. I am going to stop the share now. Um, did the slides work? Yeah. Angela, I'm going to suggest that maybe you go next so that they don't have to listen to my voice quite um, so often. I'm going to try and um, scoot the, uh, the PowerPoint up to your slides. Is that OK? Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us, or good morning. I first started connecting the dots about six years ago. I discovered my family's intimate relationship with slavery. My cousin was reading a will to my mother and me, the will of one of my mother's third great grandfathers. This will contained a list of people enslaved by this ancestor. That was shocking enough, but even more disgusting, revolting to me was the line in which my ancestor stipulated that my, excuse me, stipulated that, quote, my Negro boy Spencer should be raised in the household of the ancestor's daughter with all of the rest, excuse me, as a playmate for her son. Meanwhile, Spencer's mother was to be sold off along with all of the rest of the enslaved. Spencer likely never saw his mother again and would probably have lived and died in slavery himself. I've been looking for Spencer for five years and have not yet found him. Hearing my cousin read aloud Spencer's fate my head nearly exploded off my shoulders. I screamed at my mother and my cousin. My mother quietly said, there is nothing we can do about it. So there is no reason to be upset. It was a long time ago. And I yelled back at my mom, who was between 85 and 90 years old. There may be nothing you can do about it, but there is something I can do about it. And off I went to figure out how to be this new person, this descendant of enslavers. Since that time, I've learned that I have lots of enslaver ancestors on both sides of the family. 
Nearly all were small farmers who were part of the many tens of thousands of pioneers who moved from Virginia down the Shenandoah Valley to parts south and west. They not only opened up the country using enslaved labor, they were also part of the big rush of European settlers who took advantage of the displacement of the Cherokee and Creek nations during the presidency of Andrew Jackson. They helped European America realize its manifest destiny at the expense of African and indigenous Americans. One ancestor listed his profession in the, excuse me, in the relevant county records as, quote, overseer of slaves. Another family member led a mob that tried but failed to lynch a black man in Georgia in 1902. I had grown up in a family where slavery, slavery was never discussed. Also, my parents didn't have an answer to my childhood questions. Why do we get to live here if the Cherokees had to leave? My parents were well-educated college professors. They were considered very liberal for white Southerners during the civil rights era. The truth about small town life for a white child in the deep South in the late 50s and 1960s. Talking about slavery was taboo, just as it had been during slavery and still is now. It was and is very difficult to talk about and perhaps especially so within one's own family. Growing up, how many times did I hear the admonition? Polite people don't discuss politics, race or religion. And here's a factoid for your consideration. In Antebellum, Georgia, advocating for abolition of slavery was a capital offense. So it's inconceivable that just five years ago, I would have been able to talk to you frankly about this. It was easier for me to come out as a gay person 45 years ago than it has been for me to come out as a descendant of enslavers, overseers, KKK supporters, and would-be lynchers. And yet the signs were there, and I should have been able to see the racial waters I was swimming in. My friend Karen Brannan once said to me, if you have slavery in the family, lynchings can't be far behind. As most of you probably know, the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama has been documenting all known lynchings that occurred in the United States between the end of the Civil War and the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement. The EJI has published interactive maps like this one showing where all the lynchings occurred including how many happened per county in each state. For me, looking at these maps is not just an intellectual exercise. When I look at them, I am truly distressed because I see that lynchings, what we now call racial terror killings, occurred in all the places that are important to me and my ancestral lines. Each of the primary places where my different families lived, not only are places where slavery was endemic, but also where lynching was very frequent. And let me restate that in another way. Some of my ancestors, <coughs> ancestors who had once held black bodies in bondage we're still living in these racially fraught locales during Reconstruction, Jim Crow, and on and on into the 20th century. They would have known about these lynchings, 
even if they did not participate in them, they could not have been unaware. When I look at the lynching maps, I remember in sorrow the so-called emancipation of black persons, the victory of the United States in battle over the Confederate States, the passage of the 13th and 14th Amendments. These events, which should have given free black people a new life in the southern states, proved short-lived. But as I said, my ancestors, my white European ancestors, were living in these same places, these incubators of post-slavery violence. The point was to wrest back white power and the European Americans of Angela, we're having trouble hearing you. Could someone let me know if you can hear me and if you can hear Angela? We may need to interrupt this. Okay, I'm. Um, we'll we'll stop this session now. I stop the Angela's talk and come back to it. I think. Um, okay, I'm going to go ahead and start my talk, and um, maybe somebody could reach out to Angela privately. Apologies to everyone in the crowd. Um, let me quickly um, recue the. Um, let me recue my uh, PowerPoint. And we are doing some brinksmanship today, but um, thanks to everybody for hanging in. And okay, I'm gonna start sharing again, and here we go. Okay. Okay. Um, so <laughs> for a slight change, uh, we're going to we're connecting the dots between past and present. We're working hard to connect the dots between present day technology and uh, all of you um, gracious people who are out there listening. So here we go. Uh, this is my story of um, connecting the dots. Again, I'm Leslie Stain. I'm talking to you from Ann Arbor, Michigan. And um, the moment in this past year, or the last year and a half, when I connected the dots came in May of 2020 when news emerged that a young black man had been shot while jogging in a suburban neighborhood in Brunswick, Georgia. 
I'd spent much of the previous 10 years researching Brunswick and its role in America's 19th century plantation slavery economy. My ancestors were slaveholders. They owned thousands of acres of rich marshland in, on the outskirts of Brunswick and more than 400 human beings whom they claimed as their property. This is my great, great, great grandfather, the guy who started it all. His name is Francis Muir Scarlett. He emigrated to Georgia from London in 1799 as a poverty stricken 14 year old. He became an overseer and then he quickly began accumulating his own land and human property. And of course the system in Georgia was rigged for that to happen. Uh, by the time he, this man, Francis Muir Scarlett was in his twenties, his early twenties, he was a prominent slaveholder in Glynn County and a member of the Georgia state legislature. legislature not unlike Karen's ancestors. Um, and in that legislature, of course, he worked to ensure that the state's laws would benefit white men like him. The history of my ancestors' slaveholding um, is ugly, as I found when I began to research it. I found ads to purchase enslaved people. I found news accounts of my forebears jailing blacks who had run away from them. I found evidence of rape and mixed race offspring and clear evidence that Francis Scarlett, this man here, uh, purchased an African who had been shipped across the Atlantic in 1858 in one of the last illegal slave ships, the Wanderer. Um, more than 400 kidnapped Africans were crammed in decks, no higher than 18 inches tall. Um, sorry, I heard something and I thought that somebody was trying to get a message to me. Apologies. Um, again, this Francis Scarlett uh, purchased an African who was shipped across Africa in an illegal slave ship where the decks were constructed to be no, long, no higher than 18 inches. Imagine that, crammed 18 inches high for the long, terrible crossing of the Atlantic. Um, Francis Muir Scarlett, my great, great, great grandfather, purchased this African man. And then, according to family records, he put him out, um, to, he, he rented him to neighboring planters at $100 a day as a, quote, producer of children. Let that one sink in for a minute. One of the key family members I found about in my research was a man named Frank Scarlett, the oldest son of Francis Muir Scarlett and brother to my great, great, great grandfather, my great, great grandfather. When the Civil War broke out, this man, Frank Scarlett, formed an armed militia on his Brunswick property for the purpose of, quote, protecting our homes. That very same land outside Brunswick is where in February 2020, a pair of armed white men tracked and eventually murdered Ahmad Arbery. They too wanted to protect their homes. At the time of Arbery's murder, I was immersed in yet another story of violence involving my Scarlet ancestors. This time we're talking about Jim Crow and it was the hanging of a young black man in 1901, yet another instance of connecting the dots between slavery, Jim Crow, the vicious history of lynching and current events. This is my grandmother, Mary King Hillsman Pettigrew. She was also a Scarlet. And I learned a couple of years ago from my uncle that my grandmother, Mary King Hillsman Pettigrew, had always been haunted by memories that she had of being a girl in Brunswick in 18, well, she was born in 1898. So the first years of the 20th century, um, she could remember being at home with the Scarlet women in their house in Brunswick, waiting. This is a scene straight out of Gone with the Wind. Waiting with those women while the Scarlet men went out into the dark to do something that my grandmother instinctively knew was wrong something involving racial violence. In early 2020, I discovered a plausible source of my grandmother's lifelong suspicion. A 1901 hanging in Brunswick, Georgia of an 18 year old African-American man named Frisey Griffin, whose picture you see here, and it's such a beautiful face. One of my grandmother's uncles, a man named Stanton Scarlett, who happened to be a Brunswick policeman was directly involved in Frisey Griffin's case and a key factor in this young man's conviction and death. 
This was reportedly the first legal hanging in Brunswick in over 70 years. It was for all intents and purposes, of course, a lynching. A stray Google search led me to the story of Fracy Griffin and my friend and co-presenter Karen Brannan steered me toward the research materials I would need to unearth the details behind this story. Get the trial transcripts, Karen said. So I did. It only took a phone call. It's not hard, folks. It only took a phone call and 90 bucks. And I spent most of February 2020 untangling the awful story of this young man's arrest, trial, appeal, conviction, and execution. Very briefly, Fricey Griffin, the man you see here, had tried to hitch a train ride into Brunswick, Georgia. The conductor, a white man, of course, caught him and ordered him off the train. The train was moving 40 miles an hour and Griffin knew that if he jumped, he would probably die. Uh, the conductor then began assaulting him with a broom and then throwing iron couplings at his head. So he was gonna die one way or the other. Um, Griffin had been in a card game with some friends earlier in the day and he was afraid of reprisals, so he had purchased a pistol. So now, as this conductor is throwing iron couplings at him and beating him, he pulls out the pistol intending only to frighten the man, but of course the gun goes off and it kills the white conductor. So now Fricey Griffin is truly a dead man. He leapt from the train, um, a manhunt which was led by my grandmother's uncle Stanton, who again was a policeman, um, was on. And it was Scarlett, uh, Stanton Scarlett who caught Fricey Griffin. The transcript of this young man's trial, it's the kind of sham trial for which the Jim Crow South was notorious, revealed that my grandmother's uncle, Stanton Scarlett, who was 29, by the way, had two compelling motives for wanting Fricey Griffin dead. The first was that Stanton Scarlett wanted his share of the reward, 500 bucks, a lot of money in 1901. Second reason was that he and Fricey Griffin appear to have been sleeping with the same woman, a person of color named Bella Law. In his last statement before the court, and I'm gonna show this to you because it's kind of shocking. Uh, before he was sentenced to death, Fricey Griffin asked the judge if he could speak candidly. And this is what he said. After I was put in jail, Mr. Scarlett came to the cell and asked me if I loved Bella. And I said, yes, I used to like her. And then he said, Bella will never do you any more good. I have her now and I'll fuck her, and I'm going to have her for my woman, and I am going to hang you, for I like Bella myself. The old familiar story in the South, right? Money and sex. So it was as I was working through this material and making these discoveries, and as COVID was just beginning to ravage communities of color across the United States, that news of the killing of Ahmad Arbery in Brunswick emerged. I'm sure most of you know the story. Arbery was out for a jog in Brunswick, in a Brunswick subdivision called Satilla Shores. A retired Brunswick policeman, Gregory McMichaels and his son Travis grew suspicious and began to track Arbery. They were both armed, the white men. A third white man joined the chase and filmed a video of what happened. Arbery tried to outrun the pickup. Travis McMichaels leapt from the front seat and confronted him with a rifle. Three shots and Arbery fell face down in the street. He was 25 years old. I pulled out my maps, old and new, and I saw that Satilla Shores, where vigilantes murdered Ahmed Arbery in 2020, was on land that had belonged to my ancestors, a place called Fancy Bluff, which you can see towards the center of this slide and in small letters beside it, Satilla Shores neighborhood. Um, this is land where my ancestors enslaved, abused, hunted, and raped people of color. Land where, in 1862, my ancestor Frank Scarlett organized an armed band of vigilantes to protect our homes. Equally unnerving, I saw in Ahmad Arbery the same bright, engaging, young face and personality I had seen in Fricey Griffin. In the wake of Arbery's death, a local writer named Jim Barger Jr., a white man, by the way, remembered how people in Brunswick said that seeing Ahmad run through their neighborhood was a highlight <clears> of <throat> that he smiled and waved at them and that they looked forward to it because it made them feel better. If I had not researched my family, if I had not dug through the papers I inherited from my grandmother, if I had not, as our keynote speaker yesterday said, opened the attic, uh, and searched, if I had not searched Ancestry.com for slave schedules and shipping manifests and gone to the archives in Savannah and Brunswick and talked to historians and built a collection of maps and perhaps most importantly of all, 
if I had not reached out to the descendants of people my ancestors enslaved, I would not have understood so clearly that there is a direct line between what my family did and what happened to Ahmed Arbery. That line leads from slavery through the violence and voter suppression of Jim Crow to the continued violence and voter suppression we see today. From slave patrols to police patrols, from the theft of labor and health to the theft of economic opportunity and health care. It is not hard, my friends, to connect the dots. What is hard is getting this country at large to undertake the vital work of connecting those dots. We'll talk more about that in a moment. I am going to stop sharing and see if Angela has her uh, sound back. And um, OK, Angela, do you want me to try and go back to where we were? Yes, I have no idea what was the last thing I said to you or what you heard. OK, let me go back. How about we go back to, um, sorry, um, I'm going to go back. Oops to let's go to rome georgia can you start there with your family in rome georgia well uh, yeah you can put that up and i will um uh do a one paragraph before rome georgia but you can go back to rome georgia that would All be right. fine go ahead okay sorry about the loss of my internet folks my ancestors, my white European ancestors, were living in these same places, these incubators of post-slavery violence. The point was to rest, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. The point was to rest back white power. The European Americans of the Deep South, who were on the losing side of the war, including my own ancestors, were able, if not immediately, to reassert their power during and after Reconstruction. The violence of slavery, which had been normalized in the antebellum South in the years following the Civil War, transmogrified into other horrors, convict leasing Jim Crow laws designed to suppress the vote, lynching, integration, excuse me, segregation of schools and neighborhoods, the school to prison pipeline, and so on. Here, for example, is Rome, Georgia, the county seat of Floyd County, Georgia, it's my hometown. I grew up there. Four lynchings occurred there in the early 20th century. I was born in this town in 1957 and stayed there until I was 21 years old. During that time, I never heard one word about these lynchings. And to be fair to my parents, I must say they did not come to Rome until the 1930s and 1940s, respectively. But you will find this hard to believe, and yet you won't. Approximately 4,000 people, one third of the town's population of 12,000 people in 1900, are said to have participated in the lynching of Walter Allen on April 1, 1901, in the main intersection of my hometown right at this intersection and you can see there was a statue of general uh forest there also in the middle of the street at the other end of the street was a statue of the women of the confederacy now let's move to carrollton georgia carroll county georgia this is where my maternal grandfather was born two lynchings occurred there in the first decade of the 20th century. Plus, there were three attempts by my maternal grandfather's relatives to lynch a black man who had committed no crime. They were thwarted in killing him by the sheriff of the town, who was also a distant relative of mine. Now let's move to Dothan, Alabama. My mother's maternal grandparents spent much of their lives here and are buried here. Eight lynchings occurred here over a 65-year period 
My grandmother was alive for 55 of those years and was living in Dothan. In closing, I want to bring you forward in time. This picture was taken a couple of years ago. These two ladies were the two women who raised me. They are my two moms, my two pillars. They mean and meant everything to me. Everyone in the small college town of my childhood, Rome, Georgia, had a black housekeeper. My mom hired Barbara to take care of me and my baby sister when I was two years old so she could go back to work and she became a very, profess very successful college professor and academic dean. My mom was a working mom and she really did not want to have to spend all that time in the house raising children. So Barbara took care of our family and her own family for more than 50 years. And when I was a child, when my sister and I were children, Barbara worked six days a week, Monday through Saturday. In keeping with the way things were, Barbara called my mom, Mrs. Dickey. My mom called Barbara, just Barbara. How I wish that Barbara were still here. I could ask her the many questions I have in my heart about her story what she gave up for our family, what she witnessed during the terrible years of Jim Crow, what her enslaved ancestors had to endure, what they must have given up for white families, for white comfort. In this presentation, Karen and Leslie and I have tried to situate our family stories within the larger arc of American history. And we hope that you see now how it's important for every person who lives in this country to acknowledge that we're all a part of the same American story, the good parts and the bad parts. We thank you for your attendance today and paying attention and listening to us. And uh, we will welcome questions. Thank you. I'm gonna hover over the questions in the chat. So if you have questions, maybe type them in the chat and I will highlight them um, and the speakers can answer as they come up. Thank you guys for dealing with this during a lot of technical difficulties. Um, I hope it'll <laughs> be- I hope it'll be in. easy from now on, but I'm going to. Um... Uh, there's a question from Joe. Yeah. Does the embracing of this aspect of your family's history make you an outcast among those family members who don't? Karen, are you able to? OK, I don't think we have sound from Karen. Angela, how about you? I would say that. Um... Everyone experiences this information, processes this information differently. And um, we have a wide variety of views um, um, within our family. Um, I, um, I have experienced a lot of inner turmoil about it, about this information myself and uh, have really only recently started to try to talk about it with members of the extended family. But you know, this issue is so tangled up with the current political arguments. And that's why it's important to see how the beginnings of our country are manifest again in the attack on the Capitol on January 6th. And where do you stand in relation to that attack uh, did, you know, um, so this is a very complicated question to answer. Yes, there's a uh, some people of my in my further family probably have always looked at me as kind of an iconoclast and particularly with this information really will going forward. 
Karen's going to enter um, her answer on, on chat, but I'll just say, um, actually, the people who don't approve of what I'm doing don't talk to me. So that's kind of nice because I'm really <laughs> not the kind of people I want to talk to. Anyhow, um, I have um, I'm, I'm simplifying, oversimplifying a little bit, but um, but that is one part of it. Um, through my work and through talking about my work um, sort of more publicly, um, I've actually had family members that I didn't know cared about this, these issues, reach out and say like, you know, hats off to you. Um, you know, I want to do this too. I've, and I've discovered that some of my family members are working for things like the Equal Justice Initiative, the um, working to commemorate lynching victims. Um, the other incredible thing that's happened, and this happens to, I think has happened to so many descendants of um, certainly enslavers is um, I have made rich friendships with um, some of the descendants of people my family enslaved and at, coming to the table we talk about them as linked descendants and that has been like just an extraordinary expansion of my family so um, and I've gotten to know people like Joe and to work on the slave de uh, dwelling project and do this work so um, boy all I can say is at least in my case like the advantages of doing this, you know, my life is so much richer and bigger than it was. So I can't encourage people enough to go out. Um, okay, Fernanda, you want to read Karen's? Um, Hi, sure. Um, I was just Karen typed it in the in the chat that only the administrators can see. So she said her answer is, "I'm a hero among some, an enigma among others, and a demon among a few." This work has connected me with both black and white family members who are very supportive. I am seeing a question from Jean. Uh, how do you go about finding your ancestors' history? Lots of genealogy. We want to find more. My family is silent about the truth. Yeah, that's familiar. Um, you know, I just follow the threads. So first of all, if, if you've got stuff in your attic or your basement or whatever, like work through those boxes, um, read through the stuff, start making the links. And, you know, you'll often see something in reference to an event or whatever um, that leads you to another. By the way, one of the things I found in my boxes are letters from the 1870s that are clearly my white Georgia ancestors working to suppress black votes. So this stuff goes back um, a long, a long time. Um, but um, also Ancestry.com. And if there's anybody, you know, like look at the counties, go to the county historical societies um, where your parent, where your ancestors lived. Um, I don't know, Angela, uh, what other advice do you have on just uncovering family history? Um, you've kind of covered the waterfront. I would also make a pitch again for the Link Descendants group within uh, coming to the table where we actively discuss all these matters on a regular basis. We help each other and uh, give each other emotional support on the on the way. So we give technical and uh, emotional support. Um, that's one good way. And just get educated. Once you understand that lynching, you know, the first thing when the EJI came out with their interactive map, I saw that and I said, wow, that's interesting. And then I started looking more carefully in it. I was horrified that all these lynchings occurred in all these places that were so familiar to me. And I didn't even, you know, I showed three examples, but they occurred everywhere uh, where my relatives uh, had lived and were located. So, um, you know, uh, you've got to educate yourself about the country and then also about your family. So you cannot separate the two. You need to know what are the basic facts about the country. And if you don't know them, you need to be, you know, finding out right now. Uh, Karen popped in to say, I got to the elders just in time. And she also says interviews, old newspapers were invaluable, court transcripts, mm -hmm. thank you Karen mm -hmm. for that advice, clemency petitions and state archives. So um, a lot of it is just like not being afraid to ask people to help. Mm -hmm. um, I, this is a terribly selfish little thing to do right now, but I see a question from Martha. Did you read from a book you've published? I have not, um, I, I was not reading from a book, uh, but I have written a book and I'm looking for a publisher. So I have to put that out there. And that reminds me of Ron Days who, um, talked about his book yesterday and it's I'm happy to see you here Ron um, what a 
fabulous performance you gave. And you asked, how are your engagements with extended family members, African-Americans, so linked descendants um, received? Um, I'll just say quickly, one of my cousins came with me to a reunion of, um, with the linked family, the linked descendant family last year in Atlanta, and I could not have been happier. And we, we learned ahead of time that the dress code for the evening, we didn't, we, I'm sorry, we didn't learn ahead of time. The dress code for the evening was, was white. You were supposed to wear white clothes. And she, she and I showed up in like schlumpy stuff. <laughs> and then we looked at each other and said, well, we have our white skin. So there we were. But um, that's been, I've actually had a couple of family members make connections with those linked descendants as well. And I have met their extended families, which has been quite wonderful. Um, a great question from Gabriel, and this would be a good one for both Karen and Angela. Dr. Joy discussed post-traumatic slave syndrome in regards to trauma passed down in memory for African-Americans. Do you feel similar? Uh, something similar has happened for white Americans who had generations of thinking forced on their kids. So, Angela? Definitely so. Um, I, um, in my previous career, I was exposed a lot to, to trauma. And so I've studied trauma a lot because I feel, felt that I experienced a great deal of secondary trauma. And uh, as I've researched that and now connecting um, with this story of my history and the American story, I, I believe just as strongly as the African-Americans do that we are we are we all bear the wound of this trauma and uh, the the uh my african-american friends say this will last seven generations and uh, i think that's really true and uh, you can see it in the behavior of uh people in families going back a really long time um and i would like to add one thing to the previous discussion about linked descendants you know here's one i just uh that just happened to me very recently. I was on Facebook on um, on a genealogical in a genealogical chat room, and I said I'm looking for so and so in a certain village in Georgia. And another lady said, "Well, you know, um, I'm looking for so and so in that same little village." It turns out that we are uh, linked cousins, and uh, we share the same third great grandfather third great grandfather and she is of course a black american um and she we are establishing a relationship and i have learned through ancestry that i have many more uh african american cousins and uh you know so we have to face these things the dna does not lie um we have about three minutes left and i'm seeing a question from kathy and kathy maybe you and i can connect um, about how did I find linked descendants? Um, and I'd be happy to talk to you further. So maybe we can connect um, uh, outside um, this session on that. Um, but I wanted to read, Karen says in answer to the question about um, trauma, definitely there is trauma, it is different. So much dysfunction in slaver descendant families in my book. Karen's the author of Family Tree, a, a, a really powerful book about that 1912 lynching. And I recommend it to all of you. She's a fantastic writer. Um, and her book is published. Uh, anyhow, Karen says, in my book, I mentioned this, the trauma, and have delved more deeply into it and am writing about that. Drugs, suicide, divorce, violence, incarceration, all got passed down. You bet we are damaged people. And we have um, deep, deep wounds that run all the way through this country. And until we tell the truth and acknowledge it, we are not moving forward. That's, that was the message in yesterday's keynote for sure. Um, any last comments, Fernanda, questions? Okay. I'm not seeing any in the chat. Let me see. Um, maybe this would be a good place for you to just give general. There's a, does Link Descendants have a website as a question? 
Um, I we are encouraging everybody to go to coming to the table. Um, there is actually a linked descendants working group in coming to the table and Angela is deeply involved in that and that we meet like once every five, six weeks. Um, but you can get uh, coming to the table, um, which is simply cttt.org, right? Um, yeah, there. Um, it, it's just a wonderful place to come together with people who are trying to delve into family histories on all sides of this story. Angela, you're more involved than I am, so thank Go you. Go to the coming, coming to the Table website, and then there is a drop-down menu, and you can find in the working groups an application to the uh, Link Descendants Working Group, and I will receive that and respond to you. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, thank you, Fernanda. And Karen for, you know, we, we winged it. <laughs> Sorry um, about that. You guys did a fantastic job. Um, thank I will you. also post this for Karen's book so that, because um, I bought it, it's very good. Highly recommended to everybody else. Um, and, and actually, let me quickly, if I can share the screen, because I forgot to put this one up. This has our, um, sorry, uh, our email addresses. We'd be happy to hear from people. Apologies for doing that so late. Thank you, everybody. So, Fernanda, you shut us down, right? I will. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for.